Hey, what's up, guys? This is Pastor Scott, and we're just so thankful that you chose to be with us online or on live stream. And, and we hope you are encouraged. We hope you're convicted. Uh, but we also hope that you grow closer to Jesus, because that's our main goal. But doing this, it does cost us money. And so uh, if you consider this your home church online, um, or you're just checking us out, if you would be led by the Spirit to give us a gift, then we'd appreciate it. But I want to make it also very clear that if this was just sent to you by a friend, or, or you just listen to us sometimes, please just give to your home church. We never want to take um, the finances and the resources that people need at your church. And so please, just give to your home church, and uh, we'll gladly just inspire you with these messages. Um, but if you would like to give us a gift, you can go on our app, or you can go on our website, and uh, you can give online. So again, thank you so much. We love you, and we hope that you grow closer to Jesus through this. Hey, you guys are the absolute best. It is so much fun to be a part of this church community with you. Uh, I'm so excited about tonight. I think, I mean, every Thursday night is a ton of fun, but there's something about this, this first Thursday of the fall where uh, I know we got a bunch of students coming back. Some of you have just moved here to start attending the university, and uh, we are spoiled to have you guys here, and it's just an exciting, exciting time of the year for us at, at church, and uh, tonight is going to be a great night as we, we start kind of our fall schedule here at Zootown. Um, thanks for being here. This is going to be a, a ton of fun. Um, I want to let you know, uh, by nature, downtown on Thursday nights, we've got uh, a lot of young people, a lot of college students here. Uh, but to, to clarify, this is not just a college church. So when you see the, the sprinkled gray hair in here, they're welcome. Like, we love them. They're a part of our church. There's no age limits or requirements here. This is for anybody and everybody, but clearly we understand Thursday nights downtown. Uh, it's going to attract a younger audience. And those gray hairs in here tonight, you're young at heart, and I love that you're here. And uh, all the old people that stay away from here, you're better than them. So uh, thanks for being a part of our community at Zootown. Hey, uh, tonight we're going to open up our Bibles to a couple of places. If you brought a Bible, you can start in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, that's all right. We put all of our scripture up on the screen so you can follow along. We also have a Zootown Church app where we put all of the notes to uh, our, our sermons on that app and you can pull it up and you can take notes right there on your phone and all the verses are there. If you don't have a Bible, we got Bibles up here on this table and that table back there. Take one with you tonight. It is yours. Uh, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Every Everything we teach uh, comes from this text because uh, we don't think our opinion is valid because our opinion is flawed and it changes and it's limited. Uh, but the, the opinion, the Word of God is, is unchanging and uh, so this is what we go to every week. Uh, we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 12 tonight. Uh, before we, we read there, I want to let you know that uh, at 6.30 every Thursday night, uh, we haven't really promoted this very much, but 6.30 downstairs, you can access it uh, right back there behind the coffee bar or behind this wall. Uh, downstairs, we, we pray for about 15 minutes, and uh, it, it, it's a really good opportunity to kind of get your mind settled, your heart settled before we come upstairs. Uh, it's a great opportunity to just pray uh, that God would, would do what he wants to do in our community each Thursday night. Uh, those of you who have played sports, you know that like uh, pregame pump-up music that you, that, that playlist you get that just gets you feeling it in the zone? That's pre-service prayer for church. Uh, so if you want to come, get pumped up. I mean, you come back up those stairs and like you are ready to go. Like you're expecting God's going to move and speak to you. So we encourage you not to just wait till uh, halfway through worship to actually start feeling like you're, you're at church. Uh, come at 630. We pray for about 15 minutes. And uh, then you get time for a cup of coffee and a conversation and, uh, and to find a seat. So we encourage you if you want to show up 30 minutes early to be here. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, if you've been around Zootown for any length of time, these, these verses we're about to read are staple verses for our community. This is, is a valuable, I mean, we believe in the whole Bible, we believe it's all valuable and important, but these verses really speak to us, and it's our stance of what we, we believe about Jesus, what we really want to preach to ourselves, what we want to preach to our city. And uh, so we're going to start by reading these here tonight. Uh, starting in, in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We believe that this, this life, God has a plan for our lives. He has a plan for your life, that there is purpose, that there is a future that he created you for. And, uh, and in this scripture, it relates our future life to a race, that we have this race marked out before us. And God's desire is that we would run that race effectively and efficiently, and we wouldn't be weighed down. We wouldn't have, lack the influence he created us to have and, and lack the experiences that he's 
he's, he's created us to have, that he wants us to be effective and efficient in this race of life. So he says, if you want to do well, if you want to accomplish the purposes that I have for you, you should, you should take off anything that's slowing you down. It, it identifies sin. It says any sin that's tripping you up, you should try to get rid of it. It'd be a good idea to not run with sin crippling you. But he also says that he identifies there's weights that we carry that aren't necessarily sinful. He says there's sins that trip you up and there's weights that, that pull you down. Now it's difficult to run very well when you're, you've got weights on your shoulders. It, it's difficult to run. So he says get rid of that weight. Some of you here tonight, you've got weight that you're trying to carry as you're following this race of life. Some of you, it's the experiences you've been through. It's the things that you've done. It's the things that have been done to you. It's the guilt. It's the shame that you have. Some of you, it's religious weight that you've been told all of these rules and these expectations and this standard of life that seems unattainable to you. And if you can't live morally to a certain level, that you're, you're no good. This is, this is weight of religion. I think some of us are not very effective and influential in our communities because we're so weighted down by these religious ideologies that we're not actually experiencing the freedom and the life and the influence that Jesus has. So he says, I want you to get rid of weight. I want you to get rid of sin. And I want you to run the race set before you effectively and effectively. Efficiently. This is our desire as a church, that we as individuals and as a community would fulfill the purposes God has for us in our community the way that he has designed us to. We want to be efficient and effective and influential. Therefore, we better get rid of weight and we better get rid of sin. So we preach about sin. We, we try not to tiptoe around uncomfortable subjects here. We'll talk about it. Not because we want to, to judge you and condemn you, but because we want you to run efficiently the purposes that God has for you. So we'll talk about sin. We'll talk about the freedom of the weights of religion, that God is grace, that he is love, that he came to bring us life and freedom. So we talk grace. We talk about the freedom of Jesus. And we're not going to tiptoe around that and create some legalistic society of, of rules, that we want to walk in the grace and the truth of Jesus. So if this is our goal. Verse 2 tells us how we do this. It says, if we want to get rid of these weights and get rid of these sins and we want, want to run efficiently, it says in verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. I love this. This is this is our heart. We believe that this is the good news of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, that we overcome sin and we get free of the weight of religion and free of the weight of your past when we keep our gaze, our attention, our passion fixed on Jesus. I am so grateful that the scripture doesn't read that we do this by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author of our faith. It says author and finisher. I'm so grateful it doesn't say that he will initiate faith, but then it's on your shoulders to perfect it. It's on your shoulders to become moral enough and righteous enough and behave. And, and, and I love that it says that when we look at Jesus and we just don't stop looking at Jesus, we consider who he is, we follow his leading and his direction, that he will perfect our faith. He will perfect our morality, our relationships, our purity, our righteousness gets perfected when we look at Jesus. One reason I love this scripture amongst so many that we have talked about and will talk about is it makes it really simple for us. It doesn't give us this long list of, of expectations. It gives us one. What God wants us to do is to look at the person of Jesus and just don't look away. He says as long as you're looking to Jesus and you're seeking Jesus and you're knowing Jesus, that your life is going to grow towards perfection, that sin is going to be falling off. Not because we just judged and condemned that sin out of you, but because you looked at Jesus, that sin no longer could have a hold on your life. That the weights and the oppressions of your past and the religious experiences that you've been through, those begin falling off, not because you took so many classes or because you read so many books. It's because you saw Jesus and you saw his freedom and you see his life and all of this weight begins to fall off. Our single passion at Zootown Church is that we would fix our eyes on Jesus. And the longer we look at him, the more our life is going to change. And it's not because of rules, it's because of love, and it's because of freedom. This is our message. And so we tonight, we're going into a series that we've started previously, took a break from, and we're coming back to. And we're calling this series, This Man. It's where we are just simply looking at Jesus. We're walking through his life chronologically as best as we can because we want to be a people that is consistently looking at the character of Jesus, looking at the love of Jesus, looking at the grace of Jesus, knowing that's what's going to bring us freedom. That's what's going to allow us to run effectively the purposes that God has set before us. One more scripture I want to read before we jump into tonight's text is Mark chapter 15, verse 39. And uh, this is a a Roman soldier who has just been responsible for the execution of Jesus. 
He, he, if he's not the one who put the nails in his hands and his feet, he oversaw this. And he was there, and he sees Jesus give his last breath on the cross. And then it says that this Roman soldier, who's responsible for the execution of Jesus, walks around the front of the cross, and he looks up at Jesus' lifeless body on the cross. And listen to what it says. It says, when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, this man truly was the Son of God. This man with a bad past. He wasn't for Jesus up to this moment. He was very much against Jesus. He was responsible for the execution of Jesus. I don't know what you've done in your past, but none of us have physically put the nails in Jesus' hands like this man did. Yet, even as he sees Jesus and he, he stands in front of the cross and he looks up at the face of Jesus, this man with a bad past comes to this conclusion. He says, this man... He really is the Son of God. Our hope and our prayer in this series, this man, is that every week and every time we gather together, that you too come face to face with the person of Jesus. You see his character, you see his demeanor, you see how he interacts with humanity, you see how he would interact with you, and you also come to the conclusion, who is this man? Who is this Jesus? That you would make this decision, and our prayer is that you would see him, you'd see his love, you'd see his grace, and you'd believe. This is what we're, we're passionate about, what we're going to jump back into here tonight. Uh, if you have your Bibles, again, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 8 is our text here for tonight. Um, if you haven't been around, this is a, kind of the third time we've tackled this series. Uh, so we're jumping a little bit into Jesus' life already. There's 20-some messages already in this series online. If you want to go listen to them or on the app, just look up this man uh, on the Zootown Church uh, app and you can find them. But tonight we're going to jump into chapter 8 uh, of Matthew. And this is, in Matthew's account, happening right when Jesus comes down from preaching the Sermon on the Mount, which we just spent the last three months teaching here. So this is, as Jesus comes down the mountain, uh, we're going to look at this story. Uh, if you want to look further into it, three of the Gospels take this into account. It's in Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 5 as well. Account the same story, almost word for word. A very, very few different words that you can look at uh, with their different accounts. But tonight, we're going to look at, at Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew's account of this. It says uh, in verse 1, it says, large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. So he's got a lot of big, a lot of, uh, a big following. A lot of people just heard his message and they're following him down the mountain. Verse 2, suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. We'll stop there. My hope, my prayer tonight is that we can take these four verses, we can see the character of Jesus and see how he interacts with humanity and how he interacts with you tonight. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? Father, we pray that uh, your word, these, this simple story that we have just read, that it would speak to our lives today. We thank you that the Bible is alive and it's active, that this is not just historical context for us to just observe, but it is alive and it's going to speak to our very hearts here tonight. Father, I thank you that you know every heart, you know every circumstance, you know every doubt, every fear, every question, and you can speak into those here tonight. So Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open, receptive. And allow you to speak to us. And I thank you that tonight, just as you cleansed that leper and you brought healing, I believe that tonight there's going to be healing, there's going to be freedom, there's going to be deliverance, there's going to be hope brought to your people. Because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. The way that you love this man in the story, you love your kids here tonight. We're excited to see how you want to speak to us, how you want to show us your love and your grace. You're such a great God. We love you. It's your name we're gathered. It's in your name we pray. And Zootown said, Amen. Amen. For those of you that are new, Zootown, we don't think church is a library. It's okay to be a little bit responsive. It's okay if you like something to laugh or uh, uh, to say amen. Or you can like elbow your neighbor and say, that's, that's talking to me. Or you can elbow and say, he's definitely talking to you. Uh, it's cool. It's not a library. This is church. This is life. This is freedom. Uh, so let's enjoy it. Hey, uh. Are any of you uh, easily startled? Like, it's, you're easily scared, you're easily startled. Uh, anyone willing to admit, like, you jump and scream and squeal? At, at, yeah, easily. I love it. 
One of the best parts about being a dad is you have a wife and children to jump behind, from behind corners and scare. Like, I just, I love it. Scaring people is, 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 is fun. It's a good pastime. Uh, a lot of our staff enjoys trying to scare each other, and it's best when you can catch it on video. Uh, like it's, it's the best. Uh, but when we're startled, when you just uh, have this, this shock, this surprise of something that scares you, uh, it's in our nature to, to, to not really consider the way that we look or the expressions. Like just what is natural comes out of us. And, uh, and I love it when you have the chance to video someone getting scared, someone getting startled. Um, some of you have maybe been to like some haunted houses or just some scary stuff, especially around Halloween that are set up. Uh, there were some people in our church, some uh, the young people in our church a couple years ago went to a, a haunted house uh, type thing and, and were getting scared all over the place. And there was this one spot where, where something jumps out at you to scare you and they instantaneously take a picture of that reaction. I think it's beautiful. Uh, would you like to see a picture? Okay, here we go. Uh, this is, here we go. So in the yellow, we got Pastor Joey, who is in charge of our student ministries. And we got Paige in the front. And here in the flannel, this is, this is Pete Waldy hiding behind his wife. Like, you're jumping. <laughs> Were they married yet? Are you here tonight, Pete, Paige? Not here? Were they married yet? I don't think so. She still married him after this. Uh, and we got Nate. I don't even know the contortion of his face. Can you show that picture zoomed in on Joey? I mean, this is amazing. <laughs> Joey, where are you at? I love you, brother. <laughs> I mean, this is, this, is, this, this is pure terror. This is being shocked and surprised by something you didn't expect. And, and the truth is, we all react in some of these degrees. I think in a similar way, maybe less humorous, we see this happening at the beginning of the story. It says that there are crowds of people who are following Jesus. And then the first word of verse 2 says, suddenly meaning it was a surprise. It was unexpected. Nobody saw this coming. It says, suddenly, a man with leprosy comes and kneels down in front of Jesus. Now, this is, this is startling and this is shocking because of what leprosy is. As I studied this week, leprosy in the Bible has, has various terms. It really is any skin disease, anything from a, a simple rash to what we know as leprosy that, that is this, this deteriorating your, your skin and, and where fingers can fall off and hair can fall out. And, and, and it's a really grotesque a sickness. And there's a stench and an odor that comes along with it. And, and it's a really scary sight when someone has, has bad leprosy. In Luke's account, which we didn't read tonight, but Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. And in his account of this story, he says that this man of leprosy had an advanced case of leprosy. That we know that this guy, as, as much as the Bible talks about various forms of skin diseases, this guy had an advanced form of leprosy. So there has to be some level of conjecture here of how bad he looked and how scary he looked. But we can at least come to a... a, a I think an honest place where it, was, it wasn't good. It wasn't pretty. An advanced case meant he had had this for years, possibly decades. And this, his skin had continued to get worse and deteriorate and the potential of, uh, of limbs falling off and, and open sores and definitely a stench. Hair could have fallen out. This, this was not going to be a pretty sight. And it says that as this crowd is in awe of what Jesus has just said, they're excited, they're all on the same page, they're on the same team, then in the middle of this crowd, they start hearing screams because suddenly this man with an advanced case of grotesque leprosy is in their midst and everyone begins to scatter. There are faces like we saw in Joey in, on their faces, maybe a little less hiding behind their wives, but, but they're scared. Like this is, this is reason to create distance, to back away. They are shocked. They are startled because of what they have just seen. And this isn't just a haunted house where they know it's fake. This guy really has leprosy. And as far as they know, this is contagious. I must get a distance. This is scary. Bring the kids in close. Let's create some distance. This is, this is a scary moment. And it's real for them. And it's intense. And the guy isn't leaving. It's not just I'm scared and then I get over it. Like this is, this is a scary moment for them. He shows up suddenly, and it says that he kneels down, he bows down before Jesus. Now, as it comes to, to leprosy, uh, if you want to do a further study that's amazing, you need to go check out in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. Uh, we don't have time here tonight to discuss all that it teaches, but it's beautiful and has some symbolism uh, pointing us to Jesus. But in chapter 13, uh, it's, it's 
God's requirements of what ought to be done when someone has a leprous skin disease. Uh, all kinds of skin disease, what they have to do and, and how often they have to come and they have to show their wounds to the priests. And, and if things aren't getting better, that, then they have, to, they have to wait and get it checked again and again. And it tells, it describes what must be done for someone who has, has leprosy. And then you get to chapter 14, and chapter 14 uh, tells us what must be done if someone has, has been cleansed from leprosy, their leprosy gets better, their skin condition clears up, how to restore them back into the community, how to, how to make them clean once again. And so some really cool chapters, we're going to spend time on them here tonight, but I do want to read two verses just to put a little bit of context to what this man, his life has looked like, what he's gone through. It says in verses 45 and 46 of chapter 13, it says, those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth and call out, unclean, unclean. As long as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean, which means they are disqualified to go into the temple, disqualified from all religious practices. They are ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside the camp. So this is this guy's world. He's got an advanced case, most likely years or decades of his life. And to consider what potentially this leprosy took from him. Again, we don't know this guy's story, but did he have a wife? Did he have kids? What house, what property did he leave behind? What business, what dreams, what finances, what future? It has taken him and now he has to live on the outside of camp, on the outskirts of camp with other sick people. That he has to stay away. He's no longer allowed to do anything religious. He can't go to the temple. He can't worship God with the rest of his community. He, he has to stay at a distance. And any time that he comes near his community that is clean, that isn't contaminated, says he has to, he has to, he's wrapped up and he has to cover his mouth and he has to yell, unclean, unclean, because nobody wants to get contaminated by him. So it's his responsibility to let everybody know. So anytime he has come to a setting like this in the last years of his life, he has to yell out, unclean, I'm dirty, I'm gross, I'm disqualified, you need to get away, I'm not, I'm not good, I'm not worthy. And then he has to go through this, he has to show his wounds that he knows what they mean, he has to show them to the priests, and then he has to make the long walk back yelling, I'm, I'm still unclean, I'm still dirty, and he has to go back to his colony, back to his sickness, and he, this is his life. This is, this is what he has been, he's been walking through. And he has gone to the priest time and time again. And every time he's turned away, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. He's gone time after time and every time he's been rejected, identified as unclean, and he's left hopeless. Imagine what this guy is going through emotionally at this point. But he's in the colony and he hears some stirrings about this guy named Jesus. And he hears that Jesus is performing miracles and that people are being healed. And he begins to hear these, these, these stories and these rumors about Jesus and, and hope begins to stir in his heart once again. When he thought, I guess this is, this is my future, this will be the rest of my life, hope begins to stir inside of his heart once again. Finally to the point where he says, you know what? Staying here isn't going to do me any good. I've tried everything I can to fix myself. I've tried every medicine. I've tried every doctor. I've tried all the advice. Nothing seems to be able to fix me. Staying here isn't going to do me any good. I'm going to leave this colony and I'm going to go find Jesus. He, he gets this point of desperation where he's going to leave the colony behind. Imagine the conversations of the other guys with leprosy in that moment. As he begins to pack up his stuff, he's like, I, I'm going to go. Imagine them trying to talk him out of it. Like, what do you, you can't do this. You've always been sick. You're going to always be sick. Just accept this. This is who you are. This, this is you. And, and he's like, no, I, I got to believe that, that there's got to be hope. There has to be something outside of this. And they begin to tell him, you know the rules. We knew the rules before we got leprosy. If you have it, you can't go there. You can't go in there. You're not allowed. You're not good. You're unclean. You know the rules. I want to tell you tonight that broken people don't need rules. They need the love of Jesus. They need grace. They need mercy. And desperation raised up inside of this man to the point where he says, I know your rules. I know the regulations. But I need hope. 
I need a future. I need to believe that this isn't who I am for the rest of my life. Forget your rules. I'm checking out Jesus. Maybe you're here tonight and you are broken. And you are so sick and tired of of what is told to you. The way that you get better, the way that you heal yourself is on your shoulders. Well, you just got to change yourself. You got to have more discipline. You got to have more education. You got to make better decisions. And it's all put on you and you can't seem to fix it. Or maybe it's it's been on your shoulders that, that you're here tonight and you're broken and you have been identified and told this is who you are. You're never going to get better. You'll never break that addiction. You'll never have a good relationship. You'll never be successful. You'll never have a job. Hey, you get spoken all of this brokenness over you and you have settled into this place where I guess this is my life. I want to tell you tonight there is hope and his name is Jesus. And I hope that tonight you are here because there is a desperation brewing inside of you once again. That this can't be it. This can't be my future. There has to be something more. And he leaves the leper colony. His desperation for healing, for freedom, for acceptance made him leave what was comfortable, what he knew. And he knew what he was risking. No indication this was going to work. Probably going to get ridiculed told to go away, told how disgusting he was, how much he shouldn't be here, but he risks it anyway. My prayer is that tonight, if you're in a place of desperation, you're willing to take the risk to go find Jesus, to draw near to Jesus, to experience who Jesus is. And as he falls down before Jesus, it says in verse two, this is what he says, with his face to the ground, everyone's scattered, everyone's scared of him. Silence has overcome the crowd. He says, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean. He says, if you're willing, meaning he knows what he wants. He knows he wants healed. He knows he wants freedom from this life, but he's uncertain if Jesus wants it. He's like, if you're willing, I know you can, but I I don't know if you're willing to, but if you are willing, this this is my request. Have you ever been in that awkward place where you know what you want, but you don't know if the person that you're with wants the same thing, so you're kind of unsure how to approach the topic? Uh, This is like every time we order food. Like, it's difficult. I I, I don't want to make a mistake here. Uh, When Danny and I, the first movie we ever went to together uh, in high school uh, was was Finding Nemo. We're rebels, I'm telling you. We're crazy. Went to Finding Nemo with some of our friends, and uh, we sat down next to each other, and I'm sitting next to her, and, uh, and the movie starts going, and, and it's not very long into the movie where I realize I'm not really paying much attention to, to Nemo and, and where he went, uh, because I look down next to me, and Danny's hand is sitting inches away from me, and uh, I began to develop this desire. I was like, I, I want to touch it. It's like... This is the night, I, I, I think I'm gonna hold that hand. And it took a while to consider and contemplate in my mind how this was gonna work. Cause I, I began to realize what I wanted. I wasn't sure if this is what she wanted. And so it was an awkward moment, like how do I approach? I'm willing, are you willing? And, uh, and so finally, I, 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 it was far too long in the movie. I, I still regret it to this day, how long it took me to work up the courage. But I finally lean over to her and I say, can I hold your hand? And I'm just like, <laughs> and I'm just like suspense. I finally said it. And she leans over to me and I'll make fun of her till the day that we die. She says, do you want to? Like, nope, just checking if you did. No. I was like, yeah, I actually do. Uh, I do want to hold it. I tell you what, we held hands for about 10 more minutes and the credits started rolling. We like hit it from our friends. We're fine. But it's this awkward moment where you know what you want. You're unsure if they want. And this is where this, this leper is. He knows what he wants. And he comes to Jesus. He says, I know what I want. I'm willing to let you heal me, to cleanse me. I just don't know if you want to. I don't know you very well, Jesus. I don't really know your personality. I've heard some stories. Some people really like you. Some people hate you. I don't know what to think. I don't know if you will want to heal me. 
I know my story, but I'm, I'm not real sure about Jesus. And he doesn't know what, what Jesus' response is going to be. But I love the faith that he has. This is risky. He could easily be rejected in front of his community. Jesus could easily say, sorry, bud. Why don't you go back to your colony? And the shame and the ridicule. It takes faith. It takes a bit of boldness to say, I, Jesus, I, I don't know you, but I'm willing to put myself out there. If you want to do something in my life, I'm right here. I love the faith that even what he does say, he says, if you're willing, but he says, you can heal me. He doesn't say, if you're willing and if you're able, would you heal me? He says, if you want to, I know you can. Like, I, this is what I do know. You've done it before. I've, I've heard stories of other people. And if you want to, you can do it. But what is hanging in the balance is not his desire, is not his ability, is not his, his, his intentions moving forward. What is hanging in the balance of healing or not is, is Jesus willing? Does Jesus want to? There's so much suspense in this moment. He finally put it out there. He made his request. He made it known, this is what I want. And now we've got crowds of people watching, wondering what's going to happen in this moment. Who is Jesus really? What is his character? And it is just this zoom in focus on what Jesus is going to respond to this man. Verse 3, we see the beauty and the love of Jesus in such a beautiful way. It says, Jesus reached out. In Mark's account, it says, moved with compassion. Meaning that what Jesus, he sees this man. He sees him in his brokenness. He sees the reaction of the people around him. He sees how desperate he is. And he doesn't do this out of obligation because the crowds are watching. It says he sees this man and he loves him. And what he's about to do comes purely out of compassion for a broken man. It says he sees him and moved with compassion, he touches him. And then he speaks. He says, I am willing. Be healed. He says, I am willing. Be healed. There's so much beauty in this because Jesus, we see in the other stories, he has the ability to heal just by speaking. There's several cases where he just speaks healing. He doesn't have to draw near, he doesn't have to touch, and healing happens. There's stories where Jesus speaks healing from cities away and someone gets healed. He's not even within miles of this person. We see when he raises Lazarus from the dead, he stands outside the tomb. He says, Lazarus, you come to me. He says, you get out here. And Lazarus comes out and walks to him. We see Jesus heal in various ways. He didn't have to touch this man. He could have healed him any way he wanted. But Jesus, moved with compassion, before he speaks a word, he touches this man. This man hasn't experienced physical touch in years, decades. Not so much as a high five, a tap on the shoulder, a hug. His wife hasn't scratched his back before bed. It's like the best touch, I'm just telling you. I love a back scratch. He hasn't had any touch. He hasn't had a friendly rub on the head. or a, He's not experienced touch. And the first thing Jesus does before he utters a word, when all the crowd is wondering, is he sees the man on his knees and he gets down next to him and he touches him. I want to tell you the gospel, the good news of Jesus is summed up in this touch. He didn't wait till after he was clean to touch him. He didn't wait till after he was better to touch him. He didn't wait till after he took a few classes and, and, and had some, some, some addictions broken. And he didn't wait till that relationship got mended. He touched him at his worst. This is the gospel. Jesus is not waiting for you to get clean before he is willing to touch you. He says, I see you in your dirt. I see what people have labeled you. I've seen what you're ashamed of. I have seen how messed up and dirty your soul is. And I'm getting right in there with you. And I'm not waiting for you to get better to touch you. I'm going to love you right where you are. And somebody here tonight needs to hear that Jesus is not waiting for you to finally get things lined up. He says, I'm here now. 
and I'm going to touch you first. I'm going to be the author and the perfecter. I'm not going to make you figure this out on your own. We're going to walk through this together, and I'm going to love you right here, right now, just the way that you are. What's crazy about this, too, is leprosy and, and other forms of uncleanliness all throughout the Old Testament and their entire culture. Whenever something was unclean and something else or someone else touched that which was unclean, the uncleanliness spreads to what was clean before. Unclean was always more powerful than clean. The before unclean could be touched again, it had to go through these ceremonial cleansing rites before it could be touched. Unclean was always more powerful than clean. Jesus flips the script. Scripture says that when Jesus touches us, it says he took on our sins. He took on our infirmities. Our infirmities. He became our sin. That when he touches you and he touches me, what your sickness, what your sin, what your leprosy is, that for the first time ever, instead of him becoming unclean, he takes that uncleanliness onto himself. And then he took that uncleanliness. He went to that cross. He overcame sin. And then he rose from the dead and overcame death. And he says, your uncleanliness has no power anymore because I can't came and I took it away. That, that which was clean took the unclean and beat it on our behalf. He didn't say, leper, you figure this out on your own. He says, I will take it and I will beat it. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is he will fight for your sin. He will fight for your freedom. He will fight for your victory. He says, look to me. Let me touch you. Let me show you my love. Let me show you my grace. And I will take over your sickness, your sin, and provide victory. Maybe you're here tonight and you're wondering about Jesus. You've heard stories. Some people love him. Some people hate him. I don't really know about him. Maybe you're here tonight and you know you. And you're wondering, is Jesus willing? We're all right. Don't worry about it. I'm glad you're in church tonight. Even with your phone. Don't worry about it. Maybe you're wondering tonight, is, is he willing? I want to tell you. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as clear as I can possibly say it to you tonight, Jesus says, I am willing. I don't know what you're bringing to him tonight, that you're wondering if it's too bad for him. You want freedom from it, but you're not sure if he wants it. This man is willing. He wants to, and he touches, and then he, he heals. And I love it, it says that and instantly, instantly the leprosy disappeared wasn't this process. It was instantly he was delivered. Now, I don't know what this looked like, but it had to have been amazing. I think we just bypassed some of these details. Like this guy potentially had fingers falling off and instantly they're coming back. Can you imagine this guy on the ground? He gets touched for the first time. He looks up at Jesus. He sees love. He sees touch. He says healing spoken into him and all of a sudden his limbs start growing different and sores on his body keep covering him and hair starts growing once again and the smell starts to dissipate and everything instantly, it just begins to change and he just, he stands up. Like can you imagine this moment of instantly his leprosy disappearing? Put yourself in his shoes again. Every time he's been in this situation around these people, there was one word he could say, I'm unclean unclean and now for the first time ever he looks down he sees his skin he experiences his transformation and he gets to say a different word he gets to run and say look I'm clean I'm clean he's like check this out I can touch you and he's like freaking out he's taking piggyback rides around the group like he's touching people there is no way that he gets healed and he's like cool thanks Jesus there's no way this guy freaks out in fact, we find out that the whole community begins to hear about it because he just can't keep his mouth shut. Look at my skin. Look at it. I'm clean. I'm clean. I don't have to go back. Like, I, I have new life. I have a new future. I have new hope. He is clean. He is brand new. If you're here tonight and you, you are a follower of Jesus, I want to speak to you specifically for a moment. Especially if Zootown Church is your home. Pastorally, I want to talk to you. Who are the lepers in your life? Who is it that it's so easy for us to put distance between? It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. It's painful. It's gross. I don't want what they got. And we begin to distance ourselves from sons and daughters of God. 
because of our discomfort. Because we're better. Who do we distance ourselves from? And if we are going to consider ourselves followers of Jesus, this means we learn to behave like Jesus behaved. Something we tell our girls every morning on the way to school is we say, treat people like Jesus would. Treat people like Jesus would. This is the essence of following Jesus. Are we going to claim faith in Jesus? Attend church, get excited about a sermon, and then create distance amongst people in our community for our own comfort? This isn't the way of Jesus. This cannot be the condition of our church. How do we love these people? My prayer this week as I've been studying is I've just been asking God, like, I, I want to have your compassion. Give me your compassion. Because I don't want to love Missoula out of obligation. Man, I know the scriptures well enough. I know when a situation comes up how to do the right thing. But I want to want it. I want to be Jesus where it's not because of people are watching, but I love this one person in front of me right now. I love them enough that I'm going to give them all that I got and I'm going to bless them and I'm going to obey and I'm going to honor. I'm going to do this because I love them. Only compassion can fuel that. My prayer is, God, take away my obligation and give me your compassion. I want to see hurting people in our community and I, there's just nothing I can do but go love them and help them and talk to them and invest in them. I don't want to pass by a situation and wonder, what should I do? What should I do? I want to have the compassion of God inside of me. Man, what I love about our church is we, we're far from perfect, but we do put forth a lot of effort to love and show Jesus to the marginalized in our community. We want to be a church for everybody, for all of God's kids. We want people that aren't like us and don't look like us and talk like us and have the same experiences as us. We want the marginalized people in our church. And we try to do our best to reach out to them. One thing I love about our church, and this is no credit to me, it wasn't even my idea at all, but we're, for the second time later this month, we're going to the Montana State Penitentiary and bringing Zootown Church to the prison. Because these are people who, because of their past, yes, they are, they're isolated in a camp outside of town. They are these lepers. They made some poor decisions, and they are out there isolated on their own. And all of humanity is disgusted with them and wants to throw rocks at them and says they deserve it and they should stay there. But we want to be like Jesus and go take the hope and the love of Jesus right where they are. I love that that is the condition and the culture of our church. It's going to cost us money. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us effort. And nobody is going to see it. But we want to love the people of Missoula and the people of Montana. I want to tell you, in our church, we got people that attend our church that are currently living at the pre-release center. And I hope that doesn't make you uncomfortable. Because if it does, wrong church for you. Yes, mistakes were made. But they are our brothers and they are our sisters. And they don't need rules and they don't need rejected. They need the love of Jesus. And we say you are welcome here. That this is a home for you. That the love of Jesus is not for the exclusive. It is for everybody. And your past, your leprosy, your sins, your mistakes, your faults and your failures do not disqualify you. If Jesus is willing, by all means, his church ought to be willing. Can we be this, Zootown? Will this be who we are? It says, then Jesus says to him, don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. What I love about Jesus. He's such a stud. He's, he's actively avoiding celebrity status. This is something we've been talking about even lately at church and something we talked about extensively last week. He's like, don't tell people. Like this, I just love you. I didn't do it for them. I did this for you. I love you. You don't need to go brag about it. You don't need to go spread the news. You don't need to, to post this anywhere. It just, I healed you because I love you, not to bring me any sense of fame. It's such a great example after he just talked about the wolves. Jesus says, if you were here last week, if not, go listen to it. Jesus says there are wolves in sheep's clothing that will take the good news of Jesus and even their ministries will grow. Healings will happen. Miracles will be happening. Great things will be happening. But they're doing this so that they can advance their own kingdom. He says, watch out for them. And then Jesus, his very next miracle, he says, you don't need to tell anybody. This isn't about that. This isn't about the fame. But he says, I want you to go back to the priest and I want to let him you let him examine you. Take along the offering required by the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. So I want you to go back to those guys that have seen you time and time again. I want you to go back to them. And I love that Jesus at this point, he's healed, but it doesn't negate the law. It doesn't negate what he ought to do at this point. He says, I still want you to go do what we're told to do in Leviticus 14. I want you to honor the word. I want you to honor the law. 
Well, Jesus, there's so much in this. If you, again, read Leviticus 14, there's so much symbolism we could bring out of this, but I want to make it really simple. I believe what Jesus is saying here is like, I have seen your faith in me. Now I want you to obey me. This is the essence of following Jesus. It's like, yes, your healing, your forgiveness, your freedom, it is all free. I do all the hard work and I'm going to be with you. I'm not leaving you. I'm going to sustain you. But I do want you to start obeying me. I want you to honor the word of God. I want you to get into the word of God. Learn it, study it, obey it. Let the word of God be a part of your life. It says, I've seen you put your faith in me. Now let's walk together. Now let's obey. Let's honor the word of God. But there's no way that this message disappoints this man. When Jesus says, okay, you're healed. Rather than going around and just spreading the news now, I want you to go to the temple. I want you to show the priests. I want you to take the sacrifice. There's no way this man's disappointed. He's not like saying, oh, come on, Jesus. I knew there was going to be a catch. You're going to heal me. I got to go to the temple. Like, there's no way. This guy's so pumped up. It's like, you're telling me I get to go where I was excluded for the last several years of my life. I don't have to go back to the colony. Like, when Jesus says, here, I want you to obey me, I've got some direction now for your life. It's not disappointment. It's keeping you away from the colony that held you back. I think too often we come to faith in Jesus and then we start hearing adjustments he wants us to make in our life. We're like, come on, what, you're such a punk, you're such a jerk. Why would you put, give me all these restrictions? Jesus loves you. He doesn't want you back in that colony. He doesn't want you to go back to the man or the woman you used to be. He says, no, I love you. I healed you and I got a purpose for your life and I got a direction and I got influence. So I'm going to help coach you how to get to your influence. I want you to run the race effectively and efficiently and I love you and I believe in your purpose enough. I'm going to coach you on how to get there and I'm going to give you my word and I'm going to let you read it and study it and I'm going to speak through the Holy Spirit to your heart on adjustments to make and it's nowhere in us should we say, oh man, that's so mean, that's so restrictive. It's saying, thank you that you don't want me to go back. Thank you that you have hope. Thank you that you believe in me enough to coach me on how to get to the future you have created for me. Can you imagine these priests? I know I'm talking a bunch, but this is too good, right? All right, good. Glad we all agree. Imagine the priests. As this man is approaching, he's wearing the same clothes he's always been wearing. And every time he's come, year after year, they send him away. By this time, they know him. They know his condition. And they know that they have... They've identified him as a hopeless situation. And yet here he comes once again back to the temple. This time he shows up. And instead of walking through town, hiding his, his sores, he's just strutting through town. They see something's different, but as he shows up, he's like, check me out now, boys. What do you think of this? And there's got to be so much confusion in these priests. Like, no, 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 we know you. No, I... I've seen you. I've identified you. I've labeled you. Like, I know who you are. Do you have a twin brother that's got leprosy? Like, what's going on here? They got to be so confused. Bringing all the other priests around, like, look at this, look at this, look at this. And finally, they're like, okay, if this is really you, how'd you do this? It's like, it was just Jesus. You know I've been trying for years. You know I've wanted to change for my whole life, and I couldn't do it. It was just Jesus. Now, I believe with all my heart, Jesus loved this man for just this man. But I think he knew there was a little bit of a bonus sending him back to the priests. So I want those priests to come face to face with the way that they identified you, the hopelessness they spoke into you, the weight they put on your shoulders. I think there's a dual message here, like go to the priests. I want to tell you that when you come to Jesus and you're set free and you're given hope and you're given purpose, it never ends with you. He loves you and save you just for you, but there's purpose where he is sending you back to somewhere else. Man, where you get to go back to those very people that labeled you as this is who you are, you'll never change, and you get to go and say, look at me now. And what, what happened? How'd you finally get over that addiction? How'd you finally turn it around? How'd you finally get free? How'd you find? And you just say, I, you know I've been trying my whole life. It was just Jesus. I can't explain it. I knew what I wanted. I didn't know if he wanted it, but he said he did want it, and now look at me. I'm different. I'm changed. I'm new. Jesus loves you, sets you free, but he always has influence for you. And then his last words, it says, this will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. Go to the priest, and I want you to make a public statement, a public testimony that you've been cleansed. Band, you guys can come on up. I want to finish with this. 
The truth is, we're all the leper. We've all been infected with sin, greed, selfishness. We've all experienced the consequences of our bad decisions, of our sins. We're all the leper. The only difference is some of us have already experienced the gracious touch of Jesus, and some haven't. The only thing that sets us apart from anybody else is has the grace of Jesus touched your life, which leaves us no room for judgment for the ones that still look like lepers, for those that don't yet know Jesus. We're one touch away from the grace of God from being just like them, and they're one touch away from the grace of God from being set free. Our passion is not behavior modification. Our, our passion is getting in the presence of Jesus, letting his love and his grace touch you. As I was studying leprosy, one of the things that I never knew before, but one of the greatest dangers of leprosy is that it destroys the nerves in your body that, that warn you of pain. So there's, there's no more pain receptors. So when you're doing something damaging to your body, you can't feel it. There's no warning to pull yourself back. You put your hand on a hot stove and you can't feel. There's no pain that's coming to you. So if you leave your hand there, it's obviously going to destroy your hand. But you don't know to remove it because those pain receptors have been destroyed. This is one of the greatest dangers is, is injuring yourself without knowing it, not caring for it. In fact, studies say that... Uh, in third world countries where leprosy still exists and especially back in this culture when they were in these, these dirty isolated colonies where it wasn't sanitary, one of the biggest problems with leprosy is you'd have open wounds and at night when you're sleeping, there would be rats and there'd be rodents that would come and they begin to eat your flesh while you're alive and because you can't feel it, you just stay asleep. You wake up in the morning and you're, you're a mess. This is one of the greatest problems with, with leprosy. I think that this is exactly the way that sin works. That sin, it numbs us to the consequences of our decisions. That we can justify it and I'll be okay. I'll quit. I'll do this. And, and what we're doing is we're, we're justifying and it means that this sin has numbed us. But then all of a sudden we Years later, we look at our lives and be like, what happened to me? How did this get so off track? I never thought this was the man or the woman I'd become. And relationships are broken. And addictions are formed. you got all this guilt and all this regret. And you're losing hope for what your future could be. And at the time, you didn't realize it because sin numbs us to the damage it's doing. So finally we look and we realize what has happened to our lives. I tell you, there's value, there's importance in recognizing our condition of waking up and realizing what sin has done to our lives. Because it is that that brings us to the desperation of this man to say, I, I can't fix this. Where we run to Jesus and Jesus, simple faith in the love of Jesus is what brings that deliverance and brings that healing. And I love that it happens immediately good news for you tonight so whatever your condition whatever sin has deteriorated your life and your soul into you come to the realization tonight like I I'm tired of this I want healing Jesus if you're willing you can do this he says to you tonight I'm willing and instantly there's healing there's freedom there's forgiveness it says if anyone comes to Christ they are a new creation the old you is gone, the new you has come. It happens in an instant. Or maybe you walked in here tonight like that leper, ashamed. You want to hide your past. You want to hide your sins. You want to hide who you really are because you know how bad it is. But you can leave here tonight saying, look, I'm clean, I'm new. I'm not the same person that walked in here an hour ago. I was just, Jesus did something to me. It's yours tonight and it's free. It's not this church, it's not me, it's Jesus. This is the character of our Jesus. I think there's beauty in Jesus saying, you're clean now, but I still want you to go make a public statement of your cleansing. Today, I believe our public statement of our cleansing is, is baptism. It's something we celebrate immensely at Zootown Church. 
And just like in this moment, it wasn't his public statement that got this guy healed and clean. It was that one moment with Jesus that got him saved and clean and healed. But there was still beauty in going public, making a public statement of this is who I am. I want to tell you, baptism does not save you. There is no class or requirements for baptism. It is your public statement that I've experienced the touch of Jesus. And when you get baptized, it says that it's, you go in that water and it's the burying the old you. Symbolically, that old leprous sinful you is buried and you come up to new life. And boy, that's something we can celebrate. Tonight uh, at the back table by that water jug, there's just a piece of paper with a sign up. And uh, maybe tonight you put your faith in Jesus for the first time. We don't think there's any ceremony or repeat after me or you got to meet with the pastor. I think if the grace of Jesus has already touched you tonight and you said, Jesus, I received that, you're saved, you're healed, you're new. It's that moment with Jesus, not that moment with a pastor. It's that moment with Jesus that saves you. But if tonight or even recently you put your faith in Jesus or you become a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptized, there's power in that public statement. And I'm not going back to the colony. I'm moving forward. I'm going to run this race with endurance. If that's you and you're considering, you want to get baptized, you maybe ask some questions about it, you can sign up back there. You can put just some contact info. Um, in the next six weeks, we're probably going to do a baptism here downtown. Um, and signing up doesn't mean you have to do it, but I'd love to talk to you about that and celebrate with you. And if we can come together and make this public statement of that old me is gone, man, there's nothing better than celebrating that as a family. talked for a while tonight and I'm grateful for you for sticking here and staying with me we're going to finish with one song just considering this man and just like the Roman soldier just looked up and looked at the face of Jesus and just like this leper in his condition feels the touch of Jesus and looks up I just pray that these next few minutes in here before we leave it's that moment for you who is this man show you his love. He's going to show you his grace. Maybe you've never prayed before. It's been a long time. You don't have to sing along to all the words, but maybe in your own heart, your own mind, you talk to Jesus. You be honest. You take the risk that this man took. Say, this is where I'm at. This is who I am. What do you want to do with me, Jesus? Have that conversation. Maybe you need to ask Jesus, should I get baptized? Should I make that public statement? Is it that significant? I believe he'll tell you. He'll talk to you tonight you want prayer for anything I know we don't do this all the time but uh, my wife and I we're just going to stand up right over here at this table we're not going to be awkward or anything but if we can join you in prayer with it putting your faith in Jesus or a circumstance you're walking through or a stress or a pressure or we can just celebrate something with you during this next song you can come up here we're not going to be weird we'd love to just pray with you um, and then when the song's over we'll dismiss so if you could stick with us for a few more minutes Father we love you we're so grateful for your love and your grace Thank you that you're here to show love, freedom, deliverance. I thank you for the privilege of sharing this story tonight. But right now, I just pray through you, your Holy Spirit, you just take over right now. You continue to speak into hearts, into lives. I believe that there's forgiveness and deliverance happening in our midst just right now because of what you're choosing to do. We look at you right now and we consider who is this man. We love you. Thanks for being here with us tonight, Jesus.